Hello, and welcome back to Earth Optimism. I'm your host, Johannes Lamere, and today we're going to talk about design. So what do we mean by design? Well, we'll ask Andrea Lips. She's a curator at the Smithsonian Cooper Hewitt Design Museum in New York City. The Cooper Hewitt is dedicated to making us all look more closely at the decisions of those designers who create our built environment. Design is everywhere we look, from the clothes we wear to the phones we use and the houses we live. But what if we could find a better way to design? What if we build sustainability into how we make, well, everything? That is a question that innovators, artists, scientists, product makers, technologists, fashion creators, and more of us are asking. Design is about creative problem solving, and that has the power to change the future. So let's start with a recent exhibition at the Cooper Hewitt that Andrea Lips curated exploring nature and design. Design is about externalizing our priorities. It's about finding solutions, recognizing where there are problems and how we can potentially address those. So a triennial is a broad survey of all different types of design that are happening today. So of course, it includes everything from architecture to product design, fashion and graphic design. So really there is a huge wide range of design disciplines that are on view here in the exhibition. As curators, we then go into designer studios, labs, and workshops to see how designers then are working around that theme of nature. Artist and designer Sam Van Aken uh, uses the centuries-old grafting technology to combine multiple fruit varietals on one single tree. He can graft apples and plums and peaches and apricots and cherries, in effect almost creating an orchard on one tree. It was something that we knew immediately had to be in the triennial. Uh, it provided an interesting bridge and pathway between very ancient technologies used in a completely new and almost mutant and hybrid way towards a really effective end aimed at preservation of these rare heirloom fruit varietals. I think at this particular moment where so many of us feel fearful and anxious and concerned about the future, designers certainly very much are starting from that point. And ultimately, I think that a lot of the work that we see here in the exhibition, it does point us to a way forward. After Ancient Sunlight is a project of mine that is a algae plastic carbon negative raincoat. It's made of a plastic I developed that's made entirely from marine algae. And what I hope it does is make climate change much more tangible by bringing carbon out of a invisible flavorless gas and into a solid material in order to highlight how much of the material built environment is actually complicit in climate change, how our materials, cement, steel, and plastic all intrinsically emit carbon and how there's actually a new wave of technology coming that makes it possible to imagine new materials that don't release carbon, they actually sequester it into their materials. I do think that the raincoat is useful at conveying what I'm trying to convey because it points to, it speaks to the fact that climate change is extreme weather. It's not polar bears and icebergs. It's already here and that the materials we need to combat climate change are already here. At Terraform, we believe that in order to rethink things, we have to remake things. So this is a prototype that is designed to rebuild monarch butterfly populations. Monarchs are unique to New York because they go on this amazing 3,000 mile migration. So in terms of the effects of climate change on butterflies, it's very drastic. Where butterflies go to overwinter is a climatic strip in Mexico, and because of temperature changes, the strip is diminishing. And this building is designed to be a way station for them to stop by, to lay their young, and then to progress on their way down to Mexico. And we did all this through principles of ecological design, such as biomaterials, 
uh, materials that can be reused, remade, as well as a modularity so that the system can be replicated at multiple scales. There really are ideas and potential solutions out there that reflect our transforming relationship with nature, recognizing that we very much are a part of it and we are reliant on it uh, and need to work with it much more collaboratively than really we ever have before. The future of climate change is incredibly vibrant because now we've quantified it and now we are working on qualitative ways of showing the impacts of it. And what I hope people take away from this project is a sense that working on climate change is not just a dour obligation, that it's actually really exciting. It's a future that's worth living into and worth having a vision of that is hopeful and creates a better, more inclusive world than the one where we are leaving in the past. Nature has always been an inspiration for inventors and dreamers. Humans wondered, what if we could fly like a bird, or swim deep in the ocean like a whale, or work like a colony of bees? Let's look at what one artist, Matt Wiley, is doing to explore the world of the honeybee. It was about 10 years ago, and I was in my studio in Manhattan, and I turned around and I saw this little tiny honeybee in the middle of the rug. And she was moving really slowly, so I had this opportunity to get down on the floor and really study this little bee and hang out with her. And in that time, it took about two and a half hours before she died, and I connected with her. I connected with the beauty of this little creature that I'd never noticed before. That's really how this whole story began. I think the next time I see a honeybee, I will look at it differently. Mr. Wild E has really illustrated the beauty of bees. Let's look next at a designer who asked, what if we could create a fabric out of a coffee waste and make a product that fills a need? In 2020, online retailer Hot Hijab will launch its first line of athletic hijab. Our goal is to design products that serve the purpose for our customers and for their everyday life and all their activities. Maria Lopez, Design Innovations Director, Hot Hijab. There was a huge need for athletic hijabs in the market, so there was an obvious decision for us. But the Lavan movement was part of our main inspiration because it talks about points, it talks about how you measure your space and how you move. Uh, we also look at the School of Islamic Geometric Design, which has a lot of different angles, but at the same time very united with how you move from one point to the other and create geometrics uh, and movement. So we took that inspiration to kind of uh, bring us to how the, the head moves. Specifically for hijabis is the, the front, the front part, and this movement here, which is what the head moves. So anything that passes this, this point is going to roll up and, and move. So um, for us was pretty much this point to this point, and then these points and these points because of the bombs and the hairs. The fabric comes from waste coffee beans. The oils that they extract from the coffee lower your temperature from 1 to 2 centigrade. It's also really extremely thin, um, so when you wear it, it seems like you're, you're not wearing anything, which is the goal. 
are actually now assessing the, the life cycle of the products and once we have that we'll see the window opportunities that we have and definitely the goal, the final goal is to close the whole loop. And we are also in the process of documenting all this so our goal is to be as transparent and as possible. I am pleased to introduce Ms. Andrea Lips to our program. She is the associate creator at the Contemporary Design at the Cooper Hewitt Smithsonian Design Museum. Welcome, Andrea. You recently installed a very unique exhibit at your museum in New York City called The Substitute. Can you tell us more about this and what made it so special? Absolutely. And hi, Ioannis. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, so the story of the substitute began in March of 2018 when Sudan, who was the last male northern white rhino, died. With his death, the species of rhino is on the brink of extinction due to habitat loss and poaching. So there are only two females that are left in the world, and they are both too old to reproduce. So when Sudan died, scientists extracted his DNA They've stored it in lab freezers, and they've begun experimental de-extinction projects using his genetic material. And all of this led designer Daisy Ginsburg to question, can we conscionably resurrect the species when we couldn't even keep it alive in the first place? So ultimately, she created the substitute, which is an installation that brings back in digital form the nearly extinct northern white rhino. So what we are seeing here is a gallery view of the rhino um, who is appearing on screen, confined and enclosed to this virtual white room. You see his form and his sound are heavily pixelated and distorted. He is an artificial agent, a technological copy. He begins his life unaware of his surroundings, but using data generated by cutting edge AI research at Google's DeepMind, the rhino will begin to learn his way around the room, ultimately gaining intelligence. And as he gains intelligence, as he begins sniffing around and stomping, we begin to see that his form is becoming less and less pixelated. His sounds are becoming less and less distorted until ultimately he is becoming so highly resolved so clear that he is lifelike. This rhino stares back at visitors. He is confined, enclosed to this virtual white room, divorced completely from the natural habitat where his living counterparts once roamed. And this piece, the substitute, examines the recreation by humans of a lost species, questioning the paradox of our fixation with creating new life forms while neglecting existing ones. Would this resurrected animal be a northern white rhino if it had no other white rhinos from which to learn its behaviors? Is this the best that we can do? So why is design so important? Why do we need design? Wow. Well. Design is perhaps the most human thing about us. It radiates out from us in all directions, from our carefully crafted individual looks to our online identities, to the galaxies of our personal devices, our phones and televisions, to perhaps the chairs even that we're sitting in, to the spaces we inhabit, to the systems and networks that envelop us. I mean, we live inside a web of design that we have created, just like a spider lives inside the web that it has constructed from its own body. So design looks forward to possible futures. It expands what's possible. Design seeks out problems. It proposes solutions. Design is itself a form of projection to shape something rather than just to find it, to invent something. And it is this constant reshaping, this redesigning that is uniquely human. So if we want a more sustainable future, we can design it. Um, I often say that design is very much the physical manifestation, the tangible form of our priorities and our values. 
um, more than just human centered design, how can we put the earth at the center? How can we make the earth a client? So the bamboo theater is a great example of this. It's a structure that was designed for and built in a rural Chinese village. The designer Zhu Tian decided that rather than truck in foreign materials to a remote village, she would make use of the bamboo forest that surrounded it, where the bamboo grows tall, it's strong and resilient, it bends without breaking. So Zhu created an open air theater with walls that are made from that living bamboo. Villagers then just bend and weave the bamboo inward to form that lovely vaulted space. As new bamboo shoots grow along the perimeter, villagers weave them into the structure. As older bamboo shoots grow and become brittle, those can be removed. So here, Zhu and the villagers treat nature like a partner rather than as a mere resource. They are embracing nature's metabolism rather than fighting it to accommodate human needs. And another interesting project at a totally different scale is called Baby Legs. And this is a do-it-yourself monitoring tool for marine microplastic pollution. So microplastics are those tiny bits of broken down plastics that are found as flakes and pellets and fibers and fragments that you can see in that image. Um, they are a danger to marine life and to communities who rely on fishing for sustenance and livelihood. So Baby Legs was conceived of by Max LeBoyron in Canada to empower local communities to monitor and assess the health of their waterways. And the device can be made using very accessible, inexpensive materials that you can see here. There are baby's tights, which is why it's called baby's legs. <laughs> um, and so the baby tights are a net. You have plastic soda bottles, which become pontoons. You can see that there's rope being used there. And once the device is assembled and attached to a boat, baby legs drags along the water's surface to collect bits of microplastic for study and identification, which can often be very surprising to find. So even simple and accessibly designed tools like this can lead to acknowledgement, um, empowerment, and knowledge within communities. That's great. Now we have two questions from students in Indonesia who are participating in the U.S. Embassy's English Access Program. Let's see what they would like to ask you. Hi, my name is Arju. I'm from Senior High School 2 of Ternate City. I am the participant of U.S. Embassy English Access and Scholarship Program. My question is, how can design be used to help solve conservation problems? Thank you. Great question. So the health of species and our ecosystems is critical. <laughs> Just as much as Design can communicate the problems of species loss to hopefully inspire change, just as the substitute, that rhino that we saw earlier, did so well. Uh, design can also directly tackle conservation issues. A great example of this is the eco-engineered seawall tiles, which are designed by Reef Design Lab, which is based in Australia. So existing seawall barriers tend to be smooth. There are these flat surfaces that do not accommodate or foster biodiversity. I mean, after all, many marine organisms prefer those crevices and notches, those burrows and holes in which they can hide from predators, they can grow and thrive. So Reef Design Labs, in partnership with marine biologists, are designing these pattern seawall tiles to accommodate marine life and that can be directly installed onto existing seawalls. So those deep grooves, those undulating surface patterns, ultimately encourage colonization and growth. They help to reestablish species, and they are promoting biodiversity, including what they've already observed. There are these early colonizers like barnacles and algae, mid-growth colonizers like sea anemones, and even late colonizers like oysters and fish. So humans will continue building into the marine environment, but how can we do that and build with nature and for nature? Hi, my name is Rana from Rizik Java. I'm an alumni of ES Embassy's English Access Micro Scholarship Program. As you know, many people talk about a goal of zero waste. I'm wondering what are some of the materials that you've seen designers working on that you're excited about? Are there any new biomaterials that you think could be successful? Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There are so many. <laughs> there is ink that is being made from air pollution. Bioplastics I've seen being made from algae. There are investigations into weaving and knitting using seaweed and kelp. Um, one example that I'm very excited about and that stands out to me, however, are the biocement bricks. 
So this is a material that is being developed by American architect Ginger C. Dosier, who since childhood trips to the beach have been fascinated that things as hard and as durable as shells and coral can grow underwater. So fast forward, she's an adult. She continues this fascination and ultimately discovers that calcium carbonate is what makes this possible. And this is also a key component in limestone, which itself is a primary ingredient of cement. So Ginger then collaborated with biochemists and others and spent years researching and developing a process that in the end grows concrete bricks by mixing sand with nutrients and microorganisms to create a microenvironment that enables that calcium carbonate, those crystals, to grow around and between the grains of sand. So ultimately it just hardens into a concrete brick. And here you actually see a microscopic image of the production process. So these concrete bricks harden in about three days uh, at room temperature. <laughs> so when you compare that with the fabrication process of traditional concrete bricks, which are made by intensively firing clay around 1100 degrees Celsius, you can imagine the huge reduction in carbon emissions as the biocement scales up. And what's more encouraging is that the biocement bricks are increasingly being used in construction. They are just as strong and durable as traditional bricks. They feel just like traditional bricks. They are becoming just as cost effective. I mean, they're effectively the same. They're just fabricated using a completely different method, which is more in line with nature's own processes. So all of this points to the idea that with design that aligns with our priorities and values, there is reason to be optimistic. That's amazing, Ms. Libs. Thank you so much for joining us today. This has been a very interesting and fun way to consider the future. Well, that is all for this episode of Earth Optimism on Nature and Design. What I learned is that design is really about looking for creative solutions. Some of the most exciting design is the result of a diverse theme and a multidisciplinary approach. Science plus technology plus engineering plus math and art, that is a powerful recipe of change and progress towards sustainable design makes me optimistic. The only question left for today is, what kind of designer will you be? To learn more, please visit our website earthoptimism.si.edu for more information and resources. Thank you and we will see you on the next episode.